Okay, and I'm going to give myself just a few minutes on the clock here. I don't like to run over the presenter's time. All right, so if you're just joining us, please go ahead and check your mic and your, test your audio for us. We are going to be doing a little activity later where it will be um, good if you have your mic, but you'll still be able to participate if you just need to type into the chat. That's fine, too. So go ahead and run the audio setup wizard in the tools menu and get that set up. And if you're having any other audio trouble, um, there is a call-in number. And just in case you need that, I will um, put that into uh, the chat window for you. So you have that. Okay, so um, welcome to the second webinar of the 2016 IGNIS series. This is our second webinar of the year. We've got five planned for you in our third season, and we are thrilled to have you join us today. IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, ignite your curiosity. This series is brought to you by the SBCTC Office of eLearning and Open Education. My name is Alyssa Sells, and I'll be your host today. Our presenter today is Jim Dykus. And just let me get to that slide for you so you can see what he looks like there. And he's going to share about the pedagogy behind using peer review. And I'd like to take this opportunity to um, give a big thanks to Jim for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. And just in case you didn't hear before I started the recording, um, as a note, we're going to be using um, the breakout rooms today. And we're going to get a little adventurous with that. And we're going to be doing a hands-on activity later in the webinar. And no worries on that. All you have to do is the activity. I will handle the technology piece. Um, so don't worry about that. Sorry, I keep losing the page explorer on the slides. So here's where you can find the breakout rooms. When I create those, you'll be auto-dispersed into those rooms. And it'll be just like a regular Collaborate room. Um, you'll just be working with a small, smaller group to do the activity. All right, so um, we are having all of our webinars captioned this season. So thank you to a la carte for their real-time captioning services. To activate those captions, click on the CC button in the top right corner of the audio video panel there. And um, you can also use the keyboard shortcut keys to open and close. Um, those are Control F8 to open and Control W to close the captioning windows. And you can find a list of the um, captioning shortcuts uh, at this link, I'm going to go ahead and paste those into the chat for you, just in case you're curious about those. And um, I'm also going to give you the accessibility guidelines uh, in case you're curious about um, Collaborate and how that works with accessibility. So as a reminder, this webinar will be recorded. And you can access that recording on the ATL blog. And I will also put that link into the chat for you. And there's a screenshot there of what that looks like. You just go to the IGNIS webinar series menu drop down, and then you can select the 2016 IGNIS um, recordings. So traditionally, we have started our webinars by running through a few of the Collaborate tools. And we're going to go ahead and do that now, and then I'll turn it over to Jim. So here is our meeting interface. The upper left is the audio video panel. That's where you see my picture now. The middle chunk on the left is the participant panel. You can scroll up and down that to see who's attending the webinar with you. And the bottom left is the chat window. And please feel free to um, put your questions and comments into the chat as we go. So um, we'll be using that a lot today. Um, right now where you see the slides displayed, that's the whiteboard area. And that little skinny toolbar in the middle, um, those are the whiteboard tools. But we're actually not going to use those today, so I'm not going to linger on, on that. Oops. All right. Um, these are the participant tools that you might find handy 
some of you were um, practicing with these before the webinar began. We've got emoticons where you can show smiley faces and applause. You can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question and that will put you in the queue and we'll call on you in order. There's a polling tool which I don't think we're using today but it is there. And then if you do plan to speak, um, all you need to do is click that talk button. And when you have a little blue microphone next to your name, that's how you know your talk button is on. And when you're not speaking, we do ask that you keep that turned off. All right, so um, that's it for the getting started part of this. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jim. And I think he's going to start by screen sharing. So Jim, take it away. All right, thank you. Hi, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, Hope you're excited about this like I am. Let me uh, start sharing my screen. So today we're going to talk about uh, the pedagogy of peer reviews. Uh, I put together this presentation for this. Uh, I'm excited about it. Peer reviews are a tool that I like to use. I feel that they are a little bit underappreciated uh, simply because they need to be managed a little bit. Uh, but once you get the students on board, they work very well. Uh, so anyways, as we go through today, I will be speaking about how they work uh, from the background of uh, universal design for learning. Uh, I'm going to talk about how you want to develop peer reviews. Uh, I'll show a couple examples. I will also show an example of the peer review feature tool in Canvas because many of us are using Canvas as an LMS. And it's important to look at how it functions. Even though the bulk of this presentation has to do with uh, pedagogy of peer review or putting a, the peer review into your curriculum and, and using it to engage students, it is important to talk about tools. So I'll talk about Canvas uh, because it works well, but it also does have some limitations. Uh, and then at the end, I have questions and additional links to talk about. So let's start with speaking about why we want to use peer reviews. Uh, it's very important to look at peer reviews as a tool of engagement. And when I speak about that, I really want to speak about universal design for learning. Uh, we have our three universal design for learning principles. We have multiple means of representation. We have action and expression. And we have engagement. And although all three are important, uh, since we're on limited time, I'm primarily going to focus on how developing peer review as an idea uh, in the classroom it works well with engagement, which is the last or the third uh, principle of universal design for learning. So specifically, when we go to the three principles, uh, although they're all important, I want to focus on uh, number seven, which has to do with promoting interest. Number 8.3, which has to do with fostering collabor collaboration and communication. Number 9.2, which has to do with personal coping skills and strategies, and number 9.3, uh, which has to do with self-assessment and reflection. Let me switch to my browser. OK, so when we begin, the first one, uh, we'll talk about number seven. Guideline number seven tells us that we want to provide students with options for recruiting interest. And interest is very important uh, to learning. If you don't get the students involved, uh, if you don't promote interest, right, it, you will have a difficulty 
uh, imparting knowledge or new skills to them. So even though guideline number seven has three checkpoints, one, two, and three, I really only want to speak about number seven as a whole. Recruiting interest is important for the knowledge and uh, skill for learning, uh, for learner attention. Uh, but then we move to number eight, because once you have the students or, or the learner's attention, then you can get a little bit more focused on where you want to lead them. And so guideline number eight tells us that we want to provide options for sustaining effort and persistence. Now learning uh, for many students is difficult and we want to make sure that they sustain, especially as they go through the quarter or semester, uh, because sometimes when we near the end, uh, it gets difficult for the students to have that effort to really be engaged, to be persistent, and make it to the end. And one of the one of the ways that I found that has really helped them is through checkpoint 8.3, and that's why I want to speak about that one. Uh, like like me, I'm sure many of you work collaboratively. Uh, I'm actually involved in a collaborative project right now. I later in this presentation, when you go into the breakout groups, you will be working collaboratively. Uh, and so it's important to develop communication and the ability to work collaboratively. Uh, and so peer review, as an idea, works well to help building that communication, building that rapport. You get a small cohort of students that, that they feel more comfortable. They can rely on each other, right? And peer support is very effective when when learning is involved, right? Because students have a different communication level between each other as they do between the instructor and the student. After we speak about checkpoint 8.3, I want to speak about guideline 9. Uh, and I have two checkpoints within guideline number 9. Uh, and guideline number 9 is has to do with uh, self-regulation. And learners need skills for self-regulation. It's a very important tool. It helps them to be able to get through uh, school, right? get through the process of learning, to be able to sustain the effort over the course of time. Uh, because we want to provide sufficient alternatives to help support these learners, our students, uh, we want to help them call upon different skill level, different aptitudes, and also their own experience in in engaging, right? So that leads to checkpoint number two, which is to help facilitate personal coping skills and strategies. Uh, as part of the series of the peer reviews that I've developed, I I think it's important to not just throw something at the students and expect them to be able to figure it out. We always want to scaffold something, and we always want to be transparent as to what our goals are of the assignment, where whether it's a peer review or a capstone or a simple comprehension check. Uh, so. Coping skills are important uh, because it helps the students figure out uh, how we're looking at it uh, as far as our curriculum design. And also, uh, what we're doing is we're scaffolding, and it helps to challenge the, uh, the students. And it, it makes them step up and figure out how to be successful as individuals, as students, without the support of the instructor directly in front of them at all times. Yes, it's important to have open communication, be able to speak with the instructor, but also 
with the peers, eventually a student has to rely on themselves. And school is very stressful. Uh, some students are better at dealing with it than others. Uh, and so it's important for us to be able to help support them in learning how to develop these strategies, right, for personal coping skills and giving them tools for being successful in the classroom and especially those tools that they can take with them to move on as they continue their education. And finally, I want to speak about checkpoint number 9.3, which gets right to the heart. Uh, it becomes the most specific aspect of the peer review itself, uh, of the development of the actual activity. Uh, you want to help foster self-reflection, self-assessment. You want the students to be able to look at what they're doing. You want them to become more critical of their own work. Uh, it's very difficult to be able to have an impartial view of your own work because you're so involved and students are very involved and, and they don't see how the learning's working sometimes. And so you definitely want to not only support them but uh, help them see from your point of view. And this is how the rubric for the peer review functions. Uh, you want to connect that in a way that, that it helps them understand how to critically examine their own work. All right. So to get to that point, with all these principles of universal design for learning in mind, uh, we want to think about we want to think about alignment. All right, so alignment is very important in curriculum development because you want to make sure the whole curriculum works. It's cohesive. There's not something that's just randomly placed in there uh, because it's fun or it's a good idea. It's totally fine to have something that's fun as an activity or an exercise as long as it stays within the realm of what the curriculum is, and that's what alignment assures us. For those of you familiar with Quality Matters, uh, it really wants, Quality Matters rubric really wants to drive home the idea of alignment. So as we look at development and trying to figure out how to place the peer review in the curriculum to engage the student, to help them develop their own critical eye, we have to take a step back and look at the bigger picture of the course. So to do that, you want to look at outcomes. What are the outcomes of the course? It's very important that the outcomes of the course are clear to you, the instructor, as you're developing your assignments. Clearly, if there's no point in having an assignment in the course sequence when uh, the outcomes of the course don't warrant it, right? So you have to be aware of what the outcomes are. And also it's important to consider outcomes because they will help you with rubric development later, uh, which I know can be a chore. Uh, I've spoken with many instructors uh, who have difficulty with developing rubrics. Uh, I have plenty of very great debates with other instructors who do know how to develop rubrics, but they have a different way of doing it. Uh, rubrics can be intimidating to people, but they don't necessarily have to if you think about alignment. Look at the outcomes. Obviously, if you have the outcomes of the course in mind, as you develop your curriculum, you're going to have unit or modular level objectives as you parse those outcomes into something a little bit more manageable for the students. And within those unit objectives, you will have assignments that help support both the objectives and the bigger outcomes. Uh, that's where your grading rubric comes in. The grading rubric will work with the assignment. Obviously, it is the grade for the assignment. That's how you measure how the student uh, will 
complete the assignment, uh, but it has to balance off the objectives of the unit and obviously the outcomes of the course as a whole. One of the key things to consider when developing a grading rubric is that you have to present it in language that is supportive rather than punitive. Uh, students have a difficult time. It, sometimes it's in their mind uh, because they're so focused on grades, they all want to have the best grades that they can get, so they, they don't see the language sometimes. So especially in an online modality, you have to be clear and concise with what you're doing with the grading rubric. With anything, anything that you present, assignment guidelines, anything that you speak to the students about, it's very important to be clear. Uh, with what you're doing. Uh, and so the grading rubric, and this is another way to help teach the students how to look at a grading rubric as supportive rather than punitive. And so that's how you get the peer review rubric. You want them to see how the rubric is supportive, right, the grading rubric, obviously. The peer review rubric should be based off of the grading rubric in order to make it clear as to how you want the, the students to work. You want them to see their product, their artifact, whatever they're turning in for the assignment. You want them to be able to see the assignment through your point of view as an instructor. So to do that, I'm going to show a couple of rubrics. Uh, because every time I speak about peer reviews, every time I do a presentation about peer reviews, I always have somebody who asks about the viability of peer reviews in a non-English course. Uh, my background is in English. I am literature, composition, creative writing. That's my field. That's my area of expertise, right? So for me, peer reviews are very easy. I spent a lot of time working with them. Uh, I've spent over a decade developing peer review rubrics as they cater to and work with the grading rubric. Uh, so they've kind of become old hat, as it were. Uh, but there are other disciplines that struggle a little bit to see how peer reviews can fit into the curriculum. Now, it's important to be critical of how you're placing something into your, into your curriculum. Uh, as I said before, you have to be careful about your alignment. You don't want to just place something in there because someone says it's a good idea. Like, like I tell people when I'm helping them develop their classes, just because you can do something does not mean you should do something. Right, but I do want to introduce and stick in your minds that peer reviews are a viable tool. It's the idea itself. You want to get the students buy-in and critical thinking, self-assessment. That's what's important about the peer review tool, right? So the curriculum itself, the course subject. It has less to do with that and more to do with how you want to get the students to buy in. So I have three. Uh, I'm, I chose science. Uh, the reason why I chose science is because it is a non-English subject. But in the, in the world, even in the academic world, the world outside of science, you have to present things. We work together. We work collaboratively. Professionals work together. Uh, we have to have a way to do checks and balances. Uh, many people have published in peer-reviewed journals, right, in which we review each other, right, and we become the experts. So I want the students to understand that and be able to do that for themselves. So let's look at these rubrics. The, this this document that contains the rubrics uh, has been shared with you by Alyssa. There's a view link. Uh, I'm sure she sent it out to you. You can click on it and have it on your screen on your computer. Uh, I'm not sure how easy it is for you to see on the screen, but 
I'm going to go through it and talk about it a little bit. The first part of this particular rubric is the grading rubric. This has to do with the lab report. The artifact for this particular assignment is a lab report. I didn't include all the assignment and outcomes and objectives, but we can, I'll, I'll briefly go through them. I, I primarily want to show the rubric itself. So the way this rubric is set up, it's set up on a four-point scale. Obviously, the four is an A, three is a B, two is a C, one is a D, zero would be on the end, but it's really not necessary if a student is reaching a zero on a graded assignment. They're they're very they're just not doing it and not having and the criterion rating is not as necessary for that particular one. I usually leave them off. I don't feel it's important uh, on the grading rubric to have a zero in there, or excuse me, to have rating for the zero. Uh, the zero, the fail is very obviously that it's not done. Uh, so anyway, so we look at the criteria. And we think about the outcomes for a science course. In science, you definitely would present a hypothesis on something. Uh, you're working in a lab. You have to do a certain series of procedures in which you analyze something, document your, your findings, you present the data you've collected, and you write a conclusion, right? That's fairly basic, uh, generic science lab activity. So this particular activity, the criteria ha goes directly through that. You have a hypothesis, you have lab materials, you have procedures, analysis, lab report document, data, and conclusion. And each of those have a rating on the four-point scale. For example, we'll look at the hypothesis. The rating for a four, which would be the top, which would be the A, is a reasonable hypothesis is presented that allows for debate in addition to a method for proving. So hypothesis presented right there, we have the rating and so forth goes down. That is the grading rubric. Now keep in mind this grade, I'm not going to go through it because we don't have time to do all that and it, it would be a little excessive, but just keep in mind the layout for it. We get to the self-assessment rubric will be the next step. This is a way to help the students I'm sorry, let me get it so you can see it because it's going off the screen. The self-assessment rubric is a way for you to connect the students back to our UDL principal criterion, right? Checkpoint number 9.3, again, we want to have self-assessment and reflection. So the student has access to the grading rubric. You give them a self-assessment rubric. They complete the report, you give them the self-assessment rubric. Self-assessment rubric asks the student to rate themselves according to the same scale that the grading rubric does. A or four being excellent, three being very good, two being average, one being poor. Again, the zero is left off. And you simply ask them questions and they put the numbers in the, in the columns. I have presented a clear and accurate hypothesis that can be supported by the lab. Stephanie, um, Jim, Stephanie has a question for you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stephanie. Stephanie, if you're speaking, we need you to turn your mic on, so click your talk. I know, button. I always there you go. That That's all right. Button. I always yeah. do that. No worries. <laughs> Should be down by the chat button or something, you know, the chat area. Make it be. Anyway, um, Jim, do you, in the student self-assessment, do yes. you kind of provide the same areas, the same um, requirements or criteria so that one is about, you know, just as they're getting graded on hypothesis and the material. So these follow the outline of the um, instructor rubric above or peer review rubric. The, that is the first rubric is the grading rubric. 
Mm -hmm. And then the self-assessment rubric, you are correct. It does follow the same criteria listed above. For example, the first criteria is hypothesis. When you get to the self-assessment rubric, the first one has to do with, I have presented a clear and accurate hypothesis that can be supported by the lab, right? No. So. Yeah, that's good. One of the things I noticed is this could almost be your, um, some of your minor objectives in your unit or module level outcomes, too. It's, I, I like the way that trying to think through the student's voice that this is what I need to do. So I, li I really like this a lot. Good. What, one thing that you probably notice that the difference lying in the two different rubrics is that the rating system for the grading rubric has ratings written out. And it's important to write out the ratings because then the students have some kind of context to rate themselves on their scale. Context is very important. So even though there is context up here in the grading rubric, there isn't any in the self-assessment rubric. And one, and the reason being is that it, it forces the student to return to the grading rubric and get involved in that. But the self-assessment, and when I scroll down to the peer review rubric, you'll see that they both did the same thing in following what the grading rubric. And the idea is to get students to buy in. Uh, and, that, and that's the most critical aspect, I feel, in the peer reviews, is getting the students to buy in. Does that answer your question? Or do you have another? Yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. But click your talk button, OK? Oh, I like how it's all integrated and aligned with each other from the grading to the self to the peer to peer. So yeah, no, that's helpful. Thank you. OK, good. OK, so you've seen the grading rubric. We're looking at the self-assessment rubric. The next one is the peer review rubric. So the self-assessment rubric comes, and then they work on the peer review rubric. The difference between the self-assessment rubric and the peer review rubric has to do with the difference between first person I and the third person the writer. So from assessing yourself, the student then switches and takes on the role of the instructor, and they have to think about the grading rubric, put themselves in the role of the instructor, and then grade each other. The fir when you first start getting students to do this, they're, they're OK with it. Sometimes students are a little strange about assessing each other, uh, but it works pretty well as long as you support them and you are clear as to how you want the expectations to work. Uh, the additions onto the peer review rubric that aren't on the self-assessment rubric are that the students can add additional comments about the artifact. In this case, it's a lab report. And they can also ask questions to the author or the writer of the lab report, the artifact. And one of the things this represents is what we look at or what we call end comments and it, in, in graded work. And it helps the students take on that instructor role and it supports their buy-in to take their ownership over what they're doing with their products and bringing it to a higher level. All right, that is basically the con concept of it. Another question? Yeah, Jim, um, do you require that students also fill in these two sections? They have, they have to make some additional comments, or, or do you allow this to be blank? I allow those to be blank, but I do have them write into each other's documents. Uh, I tell them that the smaller detail, like punctuation, is the writer's responsibility. But if we see something, we can write 
uh, I noticed that you have grammatical errors. I strongly encourage them to add additional comments and add questions to the writers. Uh, it's all about how you phrase it. I don't require them to do it, but I encourage them to do it, so they generally just do it. Uh, it's all about setting expectations. So you don't say, I require you to do this. You present, in order to help each other do the best that you can, go through and add comments that will be supportive, that will allow them to allow the original writer to take their document, change it, and fulfill the goals of of the assignment requirements to match it up with the grading uh, rubric. Uh, and then they just do it. Okay, sometimes, they, sometimes you get students that don't, but yeah. OK, thanks. No problem. Now, the, the last thing I want to show you uh, is what I do. Some people don't do this, but to get buy-in to the peer reviews, I require it as a graded assignment. And because the rubric caters to the quality of the work, I grade them on participation. So this, and this could also help answer your question about the the requiring the comments or encouraging the comments. What I do is I grade their participation. And the very first one, the very first peer review assignment I do in a, in a term in the course is I try to set the expectations really high. And I leave feedback on the peer reviews. I do require the students to turn in the comments, the peer review comments that they've given to the other students so I can see what they're saying to each other. Uh, and then what I do is I have a grading rubric for the peer review assignment. And that peer review uh, grading rubric is participation based. So it doesn't have to do with the quality of the original artifact for, in this example, the lab report. It doesn't matter. As long as it's completed, and as long as the student tried, they get credit for submitting it. And I usually do on a five-point participation scale because my participation, my weekly participation, is on uh, five points. You get one point per day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's five points. So this would be a week worth of participation uh, in one assignment. So it does have weight. Uh, it does encourage the students to to do a good job at it. Uh, and that, in turn, gets them to do the, um, add the additional comments, write in extra questions. And so uh, I have two criteria. You have to submit the assignment to get credit. That's two points. And then you have to leave feedback. And I always do it in threes, because normally I, I teach the lower level classes, 100 or 200 level classes. Uh, so the size of the submission is that which a student can do a clear peer review in a 15-minute time span. So in 50 minutes, I require that they do three, they give feedback on it, and they get one point per review that they do. So they can get up to three points with a total of five. And so this rubric stimulates them to do the additional feedback work. And some students just love doing the feedback. So there's that. OK. Now, this is just a regular peer review. This is the idea. I want to speak about how, we, how it works in Canvas. So. My particular discipline, my area of expertise is English. Uh, this is an actual rubric that I built in, or this is an actual assignment that I built and I run in an introductory uh, creative writing class in poetry. Uh, the outcome, one of the outcomes for this class has to do with forms. Students have to learn forms of poetry. And so in this particular unit, the objectives have to do with the forms. And this particular assignment concentrates on sonnets, which is a fairly classic form of poetry writing. 
Uh, the picture is a picture of William Shakespeare's sonnet six, 116. Uh, and so the assignment is that the students have to write a sonnet. And then they critique each other. So part of the way the course is set up, uh, the outcomes ask that the students demonstrate an understanding of poetry. Uh, they can use poetic voice. They have to be able to construct a poem correctly. Uh, in this particular case, they have to construct it to a form. Uh, they have to write something that's compelling and engaging, so that's in there. Uh, and they have to have a treatment of subject matter, so that's also in there, too. This is the poem uh, critique rubric, so you could call this the peer review rubric. And I go through, and, and each of the criteria, this is how it looks in Canvas. For those of you not familiar, this is how it looks in Canvas. Uh, it's on the same scale, uh, except for I have 54320 rather than 4321. But each of the criteria is explained. It talks about the voice, it talks about the construction, includes the engagement. treatment of the subject matter, and again, there is the poem peer review rubric, which is the same as the other one, right, 50 minute period, original poem, they have to submit it according to the assignment guidelines, they get two points, if they don't submit it, they get zero, they leave feedback, you get one point per feedback, or for per poem that feedback is left on. Now. I do love doing the peer review assignment, but I do have to say that in Canvas, there is a limitation to the way the particular tool works. So you have to be very clear on telling the students that you submit the poem, but it will not assign peer reviews until after the due date. So you have to be clear when you write the instructions, say you submit a poem before the due date, you will receive the poem for, or whatever the assignment is, you will receive that, you will receive the, the peer review assignment, the three names of the three people, it will happen after the due date, after the assignment closes, and then you go about doing it. The other problem is, is that you have to put the peer review rubric in the rubric box. You cannot put the grading rubric in the box because Canvas will tell the students to review their their peers' work according to the grading rubric. And for me, a participation rubric doesn't make so much sense. So I post it into the uh, description section for, for the assignment guidelines. OK. Jim, I just wanted to give you a time check real quick. We're at so two, now, almost 2.45, so we've, we're getting to the activity, and I think that maybe we should shorten it to five minutes instead of 10, just so we don't run out of time today, OK? OK. That sounds fine. OK, so we're going to the activity. Uh, so this activity follows the sequence. You're going to see it looks just the same like the lab report. like example that I just gave. Uh, just for fun, just because I like cooking, uh, I wrote something about cooking. So the activity, uh, and we're going to break you, we're going to put you in breakout groups, uh, go through. We have course outcomes for Cooking 111, which is championship cooking, a class that I made up that I would love to teach because I like cooking. Uh, then we have unit objectives. The, the course objectives has to do with cooking as a whole, becoming a chef. The unit objectives have to do with breakfast foods. The assignment is to make a quiche and serve it with correct side dish and drink. So. The grading rubric caters directly to the outcomes and the objectives of the unit. Write a quiche recipe, prepare the quiche, pair it with a drink, pair it with a side dish, 
and present it correctly to the judges. So the assignment, out, the course outcomes, the unit objective, and the assignment guidelines are given. I give you also the grading rubric. And in the breakout section, I would like to have you guys work together Oops. and build a peer review rubric. So think about how it functions together. Think about developing your criteria. Don't there's a blank rubric. Don't feel totally constricted by the blank rubric for the peer review, but do keep in mind that I've presented you a grading rubric and also think about the the example of the science lab rubric that I presented. So if everyone's ready, let's get started on this. Uh, and because we're out of time, we'll do five minutes instead of ten, and then we'll come back as a group, we'll speak about it briefly, and then I can answer any okay, other questions. Okay, so I'm going to put us into two groups, and um, Jim and I will go back and forth between the groups to help you out. Um, you will not be able to see the whiteboard when um, you get into your group, but I've given you the link in the chat. You can just click on that and open it on your own computer. If you have your mics, uh, go ahead and use those. If not, um, feel free to interact with your um, group mates uh, via the chat. I will set a five-minute timer, and um, we'll automatically put you into the groups and automatically pull you back together into one big group. So here we go. Okay, we should all be back together in uh, the main room now. And Jim, are you going to pull up? Looks like you're pulling up the assignment. And uh, the second group that we were in, we only got through the first part of the peer, re peer review rubric, just that very first criteria. So maybe if we could do a quick report um, from each team, and then um, we are getting close to time, so if anyone needs to leave right at three, that's fine. And um, if we run a little over, we'll just keep recording until we're done. I think we can probably finish up in the next 10 minutes, if that's all right with everyone. Okay, Jim, um, if you're speaking, we need you to click your talk button. I'm not sure if he can hear us. I can hear you. I'm sorry. There you are. No, that's yeah. okay. It wasn't <laughs> letting me go sure back to the... <laughs> no, he didn't lose me. I couldn't get back to the menu with the sharing on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, I agree with you. Okay. To so your point. We'll wrap it up in Let me get everything loaded back up. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, basically what we were speaking about in ours is that looking at, uh, in the breakout room number one, we have a, a good discussion uh, about eating quiche and how good it is. No, <laughs> uh, what we were talking about was how we want to look at the rubric and work our way backwards. And uh, I think it was Stephanie was speaking last about that. Did you want to? Oh. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, I guess the way I would get started on this, I mean, I like the format a lot. It's not one I use. I've used sort of more informal prompts and cues, but I like the, I like the more formal structure of this, especially for a graded class. But I would work, what I would do is in my little peer rubric table, I would probably, like, literally write these same criteria. So I know I have, to, I have the five criteria. I want the students to look at the same criteria that I'm looking at. And I did have, I mean, we were discussing, like, I mean, basically paraphrasing these into the writer. The writer presents a complete recipe. All the ingredients are listed. The instructions are clear. Plus, they've added something. Um, 
so that would be where I would probably start. Um, and just almost like, like I said, paraphrasing the grading movement, but from the, more of the student's point of view, and maybe a little more, just I would probably simplify them a bit, um, or refer them to the grading rubric also. So there's probably different opinions on that, but that's, that's about as far as I got. Yeah, we were having a discussion about using the actual grading rubric, too, which, who was saying that? It was me. Was it? OK, yeah, so just using the actual rubric and not necessarily building a, a second one. And we were talking about the merits of changing the language. Just, just for the students to be able to get involved with it a little bit better. Uh, what, how was your group? How was group two? What were they discussing? Jerry typed a comment in. He said um, that we had started with something like the writer has written a clear recipe with all the ingredients and the chef's personal touch. Um, and then uh, I think it was Don who said um, the um, quiche maker. And I thought that that was um, a nice way to, to phrase it, making it a little bit more active than just the writer of the, the recipe, but the quiche maker who was actually doing something. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, active language is fun. Go ahead, Stephanie. Never mind. Oh, OK, no worries. OK, so I, th I think many, in our group, we had people that were already using peer reviews. Um, now, remember, just because I show you the way I do a peer review, or, or I'm sorry, the way I build a rubric doesn't mean it is the only way to build a rubric. Just remember, it's, it is an example, and that's how I think. What is important is the idea. So the idea of a peer review is important. The idea of a rubric is important. Uh, but they will mold to our teaching style, and they will make sense to the student. Who's typing? OK. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Since we're running out, totally out of time, does anyone have any questions about introducing peer review rubrics into your curriculum, or using them, or their viability, or even basic development of them? Hi, Jim. It's Stephanie again. I uh, just finished up the qualities, Quality Matters course in accessibility. And I would say the course is pretty much built around peer-to-peer um, -peer interaction. And um, they do have a rubric, but it's, it's just almost like a statement, you know, your, your uh, you know, contribution to your peers needs to consist of these elements. It's sort of a pass-fail basis. So I think this fits right in with that. And that, was, that way also gave me some ideas. And um, the thing about once you, you sort of learn about the peer-to-peer -peer interactivity, it is such a le strong learning experience. Because you learn from the other participants in the class of students. And even a 19-year-old can learn things from another 19-year-old. You know, I certainly did. So. Um, yeah. So the really the pedagogy behind it is very powerful, I think. Excellent, thank you. I, and that's the idea. Remember, remember, I'm trying. I'm just talking about the idea from a pedagogical point of view, and I'm giving some concrete examples, some practical examples. So I, I hope that helps. Um, for me, the way I approach things is through backwards design, and I look at the bigger picture, and I pull my way back into it. Yeah. If that helps to be able to approach building rubrics, just always think of the bigger picture. How does this particular assignment fit into the whole curriculum? So 
anyways, if you guys, I know we're out of time, so if you guys have questions or you want to talk further or anything else, please send me an email. Uh, my name is Jim Dykus again. My email is jim.dykus at bellevuecollege.edu. I am the instructional designer that works at the college, and I also teach English. So I think Stephanie has my email. <laughs> Actually, I know she does. <laughs> I just put it into the chat, Jim. So, Thank you. Um, uh, people can access it there. Excellent. I really appreciate you guys being involved and in going through this presentation with us. Thanks, Alyssa, for setting it up and facilitating it. Uh, if anyone wants to download the link to this presentation, uh, it's been provided as a share link. Uh, there are additional links at the end of this where you can look at some nuts and bolts pieces that I've included. Uh, in addition to some other uh, pedagogical things uh, and some references pieces uh, concerning universal design for learning. So that's it. I want to thank everyone and uh, have a great day. Yep. Thanks. Alyssa? Yeah, you too. I just put the link to Jim's PowerPoint into the chat. And um, I just wanted to let you all know that next month we're going to do a two-part series on mindfulness. So join us on May 12th for Mindfulness, It's Not What You Think, Part 1, with John Mitchell from Clark Community College. And then the following week on um, Thursday, May 19th, uh, Mindfulness Training and Teacher Development, Part 2, um, with uh, Bridget Ryder. And she's from Tacoma Community College. So um, mark those on your calendar. I will be sending out some announcements for that. And again, captions were provided today uh, by a la carte. So thank you, Sue, for joining us for that. And if you have any questions or comments or um, need assistance finding any of the materials, please feel free to uh, shoot me an email at acells at sbctc.edu. And uh, we thank you for your participation today. And I'm just going to throw my email address into the chat and turn the recording off. So thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.